Hello, I'm Anna Pugh. I'm a hearing therapist, audiologist. Um, I work for Otto. I've been working with Otto since the very beginning. I help to write all of the content in the app. Um, and I've been working as a hearing therapist, audiologist for about 40 years now. Um, I have tinnitus. Um, I had tinnitus as a consequence of a, an incident that happened. So um, I had to deal with the repercussions of, of dealing with that as well as coping with tinnitus, which was very difficult and strange for me because even though I was already a hearing therapist and I thought I knew all the answers and I'd got everything sorted out, um, I found that I had to sort of reinvent the, the, the book and started building a program based on blended approaches using the best of all sorts of different techniques and tools that I found along the way. So today's webinar is all about sound sensitivity and hyperacusis and um, how we can cope with noticing sound around us. So um, I'm going to start using a, um, a PowerPoint presentation just to sort of prompt us and so that you can see what's going on as I'm talking. If you've got any questions as we go along, you can put them in the, in the question and answer box and I will get to them at the end. Um, and there, there will be time for us to sort of share some experiences and share some ideas as well. So let me get the, the PowerPoint ready for you. Um, there we go. Okay. So I've called it, is it loud or is it me? Um, and I think that's really half of our battle. We're not always sure whether things are very loud or whether it's our own sensitivity to sound. Um, and I think it's probably a bit of both. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. So the first thing is that there's a, a clinical issue. Um, hearing sensitivity is, is related quite often to hearing loss, particularly damage to the cochlea or the little tiny nerves uh, of hearing the little tiny hair cells in the cochlea. And so it's really important if you do find that you have a sensitivity to, to sound, um, loud sounds or different sounds, to have a, a proper and thorough assessment from an audiologist and an ENT, nose, ear, nose and throat specialist. They will rule out a number of things. Um, quite often we find that there are some medical issues around hearing sensitivity, particularly um, hyperacusis, and quite often it's linked to things like migraines and other conditions. So it's always worthwhile making sure that a thorough assessment um, is, is done. And there are particular tests that we can do as audiologists um, to look at what your loudness uncomfortable level is and whether your loudness uncomfortable level is raised is it higher than than ordinary hearing people or is it more restricted and there's a, a sort of number of audiological tests that we can do we can talk a little bit about those later on if you want but i'm just sort of throwing those in to um, introduce the fact that there are tests that can be done so whilst tinnitus is a, is a very subjective test we can measure sound sensitivity to some degree so we start by thinking that this happens in the cochlea in the nerve of hearing and you can see the, the semicircular um, spiral of the cochlea here the snail shell which actually sits just behind the eye um, in the head so that that's a, a little snail shell structure and in that structure there's a very thin um, membrane and on that membrane sits thousands and thousands 
and little tiny nerve endings. So those little pillars there that you can see in the picture, each are little tiny nerve endings and they open and close depending on the frequency that they feel. So the cochlea is filled with fluid and as the sound waves through the fluid, the, the, the little hair cells will open and close um, and send an electrical signal off through the cochlea, through into the nerve of hearing. And you can see the little spiral there. So at the base, it's for low frequencies, 20 hertz is, is what we hear, uh, 20 kilohertz, and then up to um, 20,000. So we can hear a huge range of sounds. So some very high sounds to very low sounds, very loud sounds to some very quiet sounds. The cochlea is an amazing, an absolutely amazing um, organ in our ears. So there are some terms that you might hear as you speak to an audiologist and ENT consultant, and you might hear it when you're talking about your tinnitus as well. So one of the terms you might come across is something called recruitment, and that's a, a medical term. And that means that basically we recognize and we think that sound is louder than the sound pressure level. So I might say a sound is at 60 decibels and I might hear it at 60 decibels. But your perception of sound might be that that sounds much, much louder. Um, and you can even notice little tiny changes in those loudness levels and you're really sensitive to those. And quite often that's because there's damage to the nerve of hearing, those little tiny hair cells that we just looked at. And even though that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, the greater your hearing loss, the more damage to those nerve endings, those little tiny hair cells, the more sensitive to loud sounds you can be. So it's not just a case of people who are very deaf won't hear, won't experience recruitment. It might be that they may well experience even more recruitment. And of course, when we have tinnitus, we're already sensitive to sound and noticing sound. So with recruitment on top, it can make sound sensitivity a real issue for many people. The next term you might hear is something called hyperacusis. Hyper meaning extra, acusis meaning here. And again, it's a medical term. And it just means that you can perceive sounds to be too loud or you're super sensitive, hyper sensitive to sounds. And even though these might be sounds that are just ordinary for other people, um, you might even find soft sounds uncomfortable. So it doesn't have to be really loud sounds. It can be soft sounds. And as I said in the in the slide, research suggests that 55% of people with tinnitus can also experience hyperacusis. So you've got a you've got your own sound happening, your noise with the tinnitus happening, and then you're sensitive all sorts of other loud sounds and sounds going around you. So that can be a really complicated and difficult thing to cope with. Misophonia is another medical term that you might have come across or you might hear. And this is where you're sensitive to very particular sounds. And they're often breathing sounds, chewing sounds, or tapping keyboard and rustling of paper. And it's the emotional reaction um, the misophonia that this this relates to and it's that there is an uncontrollable anger or frustration or irritation by ordinary ordinary everyday sounds and it's not necessarily a loud sound it's not a loudness issue it's the particular sound it's the perception of those particular sounds so you may have heard of misophonia and it may be something that you're of aware of. Phonophobia or sonophobia is really rare but again it might be something that you, you've, you've heard about or that you've come across when you're reading or that somebody's talked to you about when you, you've been explaining about your tinnitus and that's where you become afraid of sound, the phobia bit, phono sound, phobia being scared. Um, and Sometimes people don't have hearing loss, they don't have tinnitus, but they develop an anxiety about 
a sound that they can't control this anxiety and whilst many people with tinnitus um, can develop an anxiety about noise and, and avoid noise um, and because they think their tinnitus might be louder if they have the hoover on or the washing machine on or they go on the bus it's rarely actually phonophobia it's a, a sound sensitivity more than a phobia a phobia is a is a, a psychological condition and it, it's pretty rare but it does happen so it may again be something that you've you've heard about or experienced um sound sensitivity i've put this in because this is really something that i feel is not often spoken about um and when we have sound sensitivity we quite often think about it in a medical way and that it's something that that we need to sort of research or look at or um, address but actually some people are trained to listen they have enhanced listening skills so they notice the little tiny differences in sound and that's how our brain works our brain works by noticing the difference between speech sounds the sh -t 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 all the different sounds that's what our brain's listening for our brain is listening for all those little gaps in between to make sense of a sound it notices when things are quiet when they stop it noticing when things change so the brain is always listening for change and absence and some people are trained to listen so they notice even the tiny differences in sound quality sound pitch um, and the timbre of sound and musicians are the are the most obvious category of that of course musicians are trained to to listen and to really notice particularly orchestral um, musicians they have to learn to recognize not only their own instrument but the instruments of other people around them and to to work and, and move and move their sound within that but other people have in arts listening skills people like teachers um i've put call center operators counselors nurses uh, police officers all these people are trained to pay attention to listen to the small nuances of what you're saying so by listening to what you're saying and by what you're not saying they train their brain to listen so of course if your brain is trained to listen it notices sound far more acutely and so it's harder to distract yourself from hearing the tinnitus noise when you're somebody that's that's trained to listen um and especially when you're in quiet places where the brain has got nothing else to do but practice and process its listening skills and so of course when it's doing that and there's no other distraction the brain is going to hear and listen and pay attention to the tinnitus and your your coping strategies your learned behaviors our habitual practice is to attend is to pay attention um, and of course to, to deal with that we have to unpick those those years perhaps decades of learning to listen um, which is not easy not easy at all and then of course sound sensitivity we talk about tinnitus um, you know when we have tinnitus our brains are listening to everything it's paying attention and because we're hearing our tinnitus we're really aware of all the sounds around us and the changes that we hear in our tinnitus and whilst not everybody with tinnitus will have a sound sensitivity just as not everybody has a, a hearing loss it's very very common that lots and lots of people with tinnitus will have a sound sensitivity one of the things that happens often when we have tinnitus and i'm, I'm sure that you'll you'll recognize this is that we have our tinnitus so we pull ourselves away from everything we withdraw we 
protect our hearing. We wear ear protection. We avoid sounds. We stop using the washing machine. We stop using the Hoover. We don't use the hairdryer. We do all sorts of things. We don't go to loud shopping environments. We don't go to gigs. We don't we don't do things because we're protecting our hearing, withdrawing from sound. But of course, the more you withdraw from sound, the more you become isolated, the more that affects you psychologically, the more that affects your, your well-being, your familial relationships, your friendships, all sorts of things, your work life. But it also means that you don't get exposed to sound. So when you are exposed to sound, when you go to the supermarket, when you go to the cafe, everything is really loud. Have you ever gone to the cinema in the daytime and it's very dark in the cinema and even the corridors, very dark and you come out and it's really bright and it takes you a little while to readjust to the light again. Well, that's kind of what we're doing to our, our brain and our listening. But we're closing away sound and then we're exposing ourselves to, to sound. So of course it sounds even louder than it would do ordinarily. And our brains are noticing the contrast. It's noticing that difference that I talked about a minute ago. So what can you do about it? Well, there's all sorts of things that you can do, but what's been shown to actually work is um, CPT and other cognitive therapies. Um, I'm a great fan of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a, a move on from CBT. And there are other types of, of um, cognitive therapies that are used. Um, CBTs um, have been shown to be the most successful treatment pathways um, after audiological uh, treatments. Obviously, if you need a, a hearing aid, you need assessment. Um, and it teaches us new ways of thinking about our tinnitus. It teaches us new ways of dealing with those negative thoughts that happen and giving us practical ways of how to cope. And that sounds difficult and it's not easy, but it will make a difference. Also sound therapy and noise exposure therapy, introducing noise into your everyday life in manageable, small, comfortable stages can also help so putting those two things together building a program um, that can really help you cope with your sound sensitivity cope with how you're feeling about noise in general can really make a difference and it, it takes some time but you can do it um, the first thing we do with cbt is to discuss how we respond to noise and to sound and to learn and unlearn that that noise is not threatening and it's not damaging because most noise is not at a level that it's going to damage you ordinary everyday sounds are not at a level that's going to cause physical harm to those little tiny nerve endings that we looked at at the beginning. Gunshots, sitting in a um, in a really loud concert next to a speaker for a long period of time, being in a factory without hearing protection for a long period of time, all of those things can damage your hearing. But a hoover, some headphones, the television, a coffee shop, they're not going to be sounds that are harmful to hearing. Um, so CBT isn't quick or easy. It's not an instant magical trick. It takes practice and practice and practice and commitment. And even when you're fed up with doing it, do it again. Keep doing it. That's the only way to get through. It builds on your existing coping strategies. So the first thing you really need to recognize is where you are and what your existing coping strategies are. 
And I know that lots of people say to me, well, I don't have coping strategies. I've, I've, I'm, I've never had to deal with this. But actually, we've all got coping strategies. We've all got to the age that we are. We've all had adversity in our lives. We've all had stuff that we've had to cope with, that we've had to deal with. And we all have different ways of doing that. It might be that you don't deal with stuff and put it away in a box. That's a coping strategy. It might be that you talk to all your friends and family. That's a coping strategy. It might be that you write everything down and that cathartic allowance of everything coming out is a coping strategy. Um, sometimes we just need a little help and to get some of those coping strategies into a little bit more sort of productive and positive ways. It's about changing our mindset, thinking more positively. And that's not some kind of mythical, mystical thing. It's really about finding counter arguments to those negative comments that I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to cope. I'm never going to be able to manage this. The reality is that of course you will. And of course you can. But until you've said that to yourself enough times, until you believe it, till you have evidence that it works and that you can, it's really hard to do and that's why you have to keep practicing that's why you have to keep keep on keeping on keeping on um and it's not always easy but one of the things that we do in otto um and in the one-to-one -one coaching is that we help you to look at those strategies and we'll work with you to do that so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and i'm gonna stop um talking for a little while and see if there's any questions that anybody's got so just give me a moment while i make sure i can work the technology there we go okay so i've got i think some questions right so the first question is are there tests that can evaluate if you have damage to the hair cells yes that's what audiological tests can do so the first test would be um uh, a hearing test and then as part of that hearing test battery there are a number of different tests that can be done um and your, audio, your audiologist will give you a a whole sort of raft of different tests to see how well those those little nerve endings are working there's also um some um some tests where we it's not a hearing test it's a measurement of of how the nerve endings are working um and there's sort of a brain stem test and we can we can measure that as well and that will give us an indication of um how your hearing is working and how the, the little nerve endings work um some ear the next question some earplug manufacturers on the market suggest they can remove distortion without which ah okay right hmm. okay so <laughs> um all right so um your ear canal um is about 2.6 centimeters in 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 capacity um and its job is to funnel sound to the eardrum which then vibrates moves three little bones up and down they then hit on a on a, a membrane which moves the fluid across the, the cochlea across the little nerve endings and the, the fluid moves and the little nerve endings hear their bit of the frequency and then they respond the um earplugs um can block some of the sound so they make the ear canal smaller what that does is reduce a little bit of the sound because they have a whole because some of them and those ones in particular that you've you've put up there um because those in particular are just basically little silicon cones and they've, they've got a hole in one end they've got a hole in the other end so they're just like a little silicon sleeve that you put into your ear which just makes your ear canal smaller um there are two reasons why these might help some people 
One is that you're doing something about it. Um, and that in itself, um, whilst people might say, oh, that's a placebo effect, the placebo effect is actually our psychological trick that we teach ourselves that things can work. And that, that's a very powerful tool. Um, and so not to be dismissed or, or, or denigrated at all, the placebo effect, it's very, very important. Um, and so that can help some people. You're doing something about it protecting your hearing a little bit by a little bit of attenuation um, it will stop some of the very high frequencies um, because the high frequencies are, are small sound waves that are very sharp whereas low frequency low pitch sounds are very low so they're, they're much bigger waves so it does sort of reduce a little bit of the sound so the sounds sound a little bit soft so because the sounds coming into your ear sound a little bit softer, that can make you feel a bit better as well. Um, so that's how they work. Um, it doesn't, distortion is a, is a, is an acoustic term. And it basically refers to sound waves and the, 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 the excess movement of the sound wave. Um, we don't have distortion in our ears because our ears don't respond um, in classic acoustic ways. Many, many years ago, and I'm a, a very old audiologist, um, there used to be a, a con an idea that we could send, um, if we knew what kind of sound we had as tinnitus, we could send an alternative sound in and it would act as, as phase cancellation. Now, phase cancellation is an acoustic idea that you send a sound wave this way and you send another sound wave that way and they cancel each other out. That's great. That works in acoustics. It doesn't work in your ear because your ear isn't a sound wave and your ear is doing all sorts of different things at different stages. So it's not really distortion and it does reduce a little tiny bit of volume, but not very much. Um, is sound and um, talking of sound distortion is sound distortion very common with a, a hyperacusis particularly um distortion of one's own voice tom yes um lots of people find that because they have a a sensitivity in particular certain frequencies certain sounds um you can feel that it's very distorted it's very sharp it's very low it's very tinny it can sound very different and it can sound very harsh um, and distorted and and so sometimes that does happen um, and it's about our perception of sound and how we perceive the sound rather than the sound itself going into the ear um, which was the other question just now um, so sound distortion um, particularly of your own voice you can feel that you're a bit muffled you can get your own head resonance so you can hear your own voice sometimes a little louder but also you need to be aware that if you've got hearing aids or earplugs then of course you're not getting as much sound from outside so you're going to hear your own head resonance your chest resonance it's going to sound different anyway but if you're finding that you're hearing sort of lots of <laughs> and, and sharp sounds that's about that distortion and yes that's that's more about hyperacusis and that uh recruitment and sense sound sensitivity um mark says since developing tinnitus i've become quite anxious about going into loud environments even with earplugs is this phonophobia okay no <laughs> but it is a type of fear and a, and a justifiable fear lots of people are worried about whether loud environments are going to make my tinnitus worse whether they're going to damage my hearing anymore um and even when wearing earplugs people people avoid situations and I, I mentioned that on the on the slides it's very common mark lots of people are very worried about going into loud environments when they have tinnitus and and and, and rightly so because lots of people have tinnitus because they've been damaged by by very loud noise. Um, wearing ear protection is great. Well done, you. I think that's really good. I would, um, I would 
definitely look at um, sound exposure, sound therapy and, and, and support on that. It's perfectly rational. It's not phonophobia. It's a perfectly reasonable um, worry to have that you have tinnitus, you think you've, you, your lived experience is that when you're in a noisy environment, your anxiety is raised because your anxiety is raised, you're hearing your tinnitus more. Therefore, you put two and two together and think noisy environment, tinnitus is louder, it's the noisy environment. Um, and it's about putting those things together, protecting your hearing, definitely, but putting those two things together and getting some coping strategies, some little bit of noise exposure and, and working through that. But it's not phonophobia. Phonophobia is an irrational, uncontrollable fear of noise. And it's it's very, very rare. Okay. Fluttering sensation in the ears. Okay. Fluttering sensation is, um, so there may well be a, a mechanical um, issue by that. By, by mechanical, I mean that there's a, a little muscle in your eardrum that holds your eardrum into place and it moves and it moves the eardrum. And sometimes some people experience that they, they're quite sure that they can feel that moving. And sometimes there's a, there's a eustachian tube issue which changes the middle ear pressure and you can feel fluttering and that can be affected sometimes by um, sound levels and um, some people also tell me that they notice it when the weather changes so um, there are lots of things unfortunately there's not very much that we can do about fl that fluttering sensation um, it doesn't usually mean there's something wrong it just means it's a response to your ear um, and we don't really know why, um, but it's always a good idea to get seen by an ENT consultant in case there are sort of mechanical or, or medical um, reasons for it. Um, can you talk about, Saeed says, can you talk a little bit about how to manage tinnitus in sound sensitivity, like a social setting and a restaurant? Yeah. Um, I think it's really important that we don't avoid going to social settings and um, going, going, going a part of life. Um, so hearing protection is always important and it gives us that added security um, and sense of security that we're, we're protecting ourselves. So I would always recommend hearing protection. You can get yourself some, some earplugs or get yourself um, some custom made hearing protection from your, your local audiologist. Um, and that's a little bit more discreet and it works much better. Um, and that's always something to do. I would always try to, again, do that in very small stages. So go to quieter restaurants or go at a quieter time. Make sure that the people that you're with know that you're experiencing tinnitus, know that you're experiencing noise anxiety and that you're worried about being in noisy places and take it step by step. Sort of go to a go to a coffee shop, stay outside. Next time go in to get the coffee and, and build it up really slowly and just do that gently. Make sure that you're always in a place where if you're uncomfortable, you can leave and that the people that you're with know that if it gets loud, if it's too loud for you, that you you need to leave. Um, and, and don't force yourself to be in a situation that you're uncomfortable. Don't force yourself to be in a situation where you're worried or anxious or nervous, but do it gradually um, and make sure those people around you are looking after you as well. It's okay to tell people that you need help. It's okay that you need to ask for some support. Self-care is something so important when we have tinnitus and that we tend not to do. Um, we're so busy looking after everybody else and, and getting on with stuff, um, but we need to look after ourselves. And so it's perfectly okay to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not liking this, it's too, it's too much for me. I need to leave. And, and that should be okay and just make sure you work that through with the people that you're with how is hyperacusis managed with children um 
very much the same way as it's as managed with adults but obviously um in a way that's that's meaningful um all therapy all support should be done in a way that means that works in your real world um i always give the example of my 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 favorite little one um with tinnitus and and she was six and um she was absolutely terrified of going to bed um because there was a monster in the room and the moment the light was turned off and the parents closed the door she could hear the monster and of course it was a tinnitus when it was quiet and dark but her her six-year-old mind had had imagined this this monster and she was absolutely terrified she was wetting the bed she was disruptive she was falling asleep at school she was um behaving in all sorts of ways that were not ordinary and normal for her um she also had some sound sensitivity in classrooms but she was finding it really really difficult and so we just sort of worked on through and and um uh, in the end we had a, a dragon that slept under her bed and kept her safe and when she heard the dragon she knew she was safe and the dragon would keep her safe um so it's about understanding and it's about talking to people in ways that they that's meaningful and and real and um, and with some level of authenticity as well it's it's really important that you you speak to somebody who knows and understands um what's going on how can you stop checking on your tinnitus <laughs> um that's that's such an issue for all of us isn't it um of course when we're talking about tinnitus the thing that we're going to hear is our tinnitus um that's about recognizing that your tinnitus isn't isn't harmful um and it's not going to harm you and and learning strategies about distracting yourself and putting your tinnitus into what i call the acoustic ecology the the ordinary noises in your environment i mean our bodies make noises all the time and we don't listen to it if i put my head on your chest i would hear your heart beating really really loudly now we obviously don't want that noise to stop but it's not a noise that we hear um we don't recognize the the noise of the hoover or the fan in the computer until we're listening to it and so tinnitus is very much the same as that we need to put it into its context into the context of it's a noise around us and and we don't have to worry about it we don't have to attend to it i have to pay attention to it and that's about those coping strategies it's about those distracting techniques it's about learning how to refocus your attention away from the tinnitus and on to getting on with your life and that's that's practice there are lots of ways of, of learning how to to refocus some of those is around uh, around learning how to listen to sound and, and moving sound around some of them around coping with those negative thoughts that we have the moment we hear tinnitus because it's not just checking in on the tinnitus it's your response to that tinnitus it's that reaction that we have um if you don't have hearing loss can you still have damaged ears um well there are types of um hearing difficulty um particularly something called um auditory processing disorder where the damage or the difference happens further on in the auditory pathway towards the brain so it's not necessarily in the cochlea itself but it, it could be in the auditory nerve it could be in the neural pathway of the brain it could be somewhere else in the brain um the the memory or the language center of the brain um you can't damage your ears noise noise will damage the very loud noise will damage your ears will show up um in an audiogram or in a an abr brainstem um test um so i'm not quite sure rav what the what the issue is there 
Um, but yes, if you if you don't have hearing loss, can you still have damaged ears? Not not really, but you can have tinnitus and not have a hearing loss, um, which is why I'm saying somewhere in the auditory pathway, the, the, the cortex, the brain, somewhere else in the brain, the language centers of the brain, the, the emotional centers of the brain. Um, if I go to the cinema, which is usually very loud, should I bring my ear protection? Oh, yeah. I always take my ear protection when I go to the cinema. Cinema is incredibly loud. I have to say, I mostly nowadays go to the cinema with my grandchildren, so it's usually to watch a Marvel movie or something like that, so it's really loud. So, yeah, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go without wearing my ear protection. Um, cinemas and um, gigs and uh, coffee houses and everywhere are regulated by noise exposure. Um, so they can't actually produce sound that is damaging to your hearing, um, but it's still a, a comfort thing. So I would always, yes, I'd always wear my, I always wear my ear protection when I go to the cinema. Um, do the damaged, Jill's asked, do the damaged hair cells ever completely recover or partially? No, you didn't miss that, Jill. I didn't. I didn't. Okay, so we can have something called temporary threshold shift, which is where the nerve endings, um, the little hair cells are damaged, but over time they can recover. Um, but obviously, if you keep damaging, keep damaging, then they don't recover. Um, I always talk about hair cells a bit like um, ears of, of corn in a, in a field, wheat in a field and noise happens like a big crop circle squashes in the middle the corn on the the wheat on the edge will be sort of bent and battered but might recover but the 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 the, the damage ones don't recover um so there is temporary threshold shift that but there is a temporary um hair cell there are lots of research going on at the moment, particularly with um, zebrafish, zebrafish, um, where they they do um, repair their their auditory their their hair cells, um, which is quite magical and very strange. Um, and I'm and I'm not a scientist, so I don't quite know how that works. Um, but there was a lot of research going into looking at if if there's something about either their genetic code or there's something about some chemicals that are produced that can perhaps reverse um, hearing loss soldiers um in some countries are given um a particular drug which um kind of suppresses the nerve so that it's not damaged by noise as much so that that then is is kind of recovering from from noise exposure um but no once once it's damaged it's it's damaged um have you uh bruce says have you come across cervical um tinnitus head movement yes lots of people do experience tinnitus particularly around this this area here between the neck and the shoulder and and the back of their neck where the tinnitus is louder when they move their head or when they're when they're tense um sometimes that's around a, a constriction of the the blood vessels or the nerve endings sometimes we're not quite sure what, what's going on there sometimes it's around injury damage to the the muscular process and the back of the skull um and sometimes it's about tension and, and when we're tense we, we pull up like this and so a lot of the the work that i do with people is around breathing relaxing opening up this area allowing this to, to stretch and open up and, and stop being so tense um but yes head movement and and tinnitus and my tinnitus changes when i move my head that's 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 a a a, a, a fairly common Thing. and i would always talk about exercise well checking with um a, a spinal osteopath and and um, various medical professionals to make sure there's not a um uh, any kind of medical issue 
but then looking at relaxation and tension within the, the neck. I've been advised to get some earbuds or earpods, can't remember which, which are best. Um, I can't really say which ones are best. Um, there are a few on the market. Um, are, there are a couple where you can adjust them to your hearing through your your app on your phone um and those are those are very good that's that's kind of all i'm gonna say about those um francesca i'm at the beginning of the auto program nearly done with chapter one well done i've never tried cbt but some of the exercises seem really quick and after six minutes right is it a question of trying them multiple times a day and adding them together how do i create a program and what should i repeat okay so yes um with the app the way that we work is that little and often because two things first thing is we need it to be manageable and accessible to people and to fit in with their lifestyle and secondly if we're putting aside time for our tinnitus i need to put an hour aside because i've got to do something about my tinnitus what you're doing is really focusing on your tinnitus making it a bigger thing um making your work with your tinnitus a lot more structured so it becomes embedded within your lifestyle and that's not what we want what we want is for you to get on with your life and have short sharp practical things that you can do regularly practice and practice and practice and practice even though you're bored with it and you've done it and oh, I've done this one keep doing it because the more you do it the the more embedded it will become I always talk about it being like um a lawn and if you go this way to the shed you'll you'll establish a path if you're going all all over the place then you'll never get the pathway to the shed and we want the pathway to the shed we need the neural pathways so that the moment you hear you turn as a that clicks in you know what to do you do some breathing exercise you do some focus exercises you do the stop tool you do the the, the refocused hand exercises you do some of the comfort touch exercises whatever works for you some of the visualizations hopefully um but whatever works for you so yes keep going um cbt is is cbt and um hearing aids are the only proven um treatment pathway for tinnitus um that we have so keep on keeping on is all i'm going to say and thank you for joining the auto program i hope that you get what you need from it you might find that you have to sort of flit around and find what works for you um but the way that i've designed it um is that they should be something um if this doesn't work then try this if this doesn't work try that um because not one size fits all um you know everybody everybody's different everybody has different coping strategies they come with different things to the program so it's about finding the thing that works for you how do i go about finding an ent who will do an extensive test i've been to two different ents and an audiologist None of them seem to do anything beyond the basic hearing test. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, as an audiologist, um, I, I, I completely understand that. And I, I hear that frustration um, with that. I would, I would say your audiologist, your ENT consultant, will have been trained in all of these techniques. They will have the equipment, they will have the technology to do most of these tests. You just need to ask them to do it. Um, as, a, as a patient, um, ask, ask them, ask them for the tests. Um, we do have um, options within Otto, um, so it might be worthwhile sort of talking to one of the team, um, we do have a, um, a tinnitus consultation clinic um, with me and with with um, a number of our other um, practitioners. Um, so it might be worthwhile sort of chatting, chatting to the team and seeing if we can signpost you. 
Um, I've been using it for about two weeks. When should I consider one-to-one -one help? I think I might be making slow progress. Everybody thinks they're making slow progress. Everybody thinks, oh, I'm never going to do this. It's never make, I'm not making any difference. I'm doing this, not making any difference. What we need to do is notice the little tiny changes, the, the little differences. You're doing something. Now, I don't know how long you've had tinnitus for, but even if you've had tinnitus for, say, a month, you've had 30 days of your brain telling you, this is how it is. This is how it is. And that pattern is already established, added to your normal coping strategies. So you've got to unpick some of those. And that takes some time and it takes some practice to change um, your thinking, change your mindset, change your habits, change your practice, change your, the way your brain thinks. So don't give up. Keep going. Um, the one-to-one -one coaching is available whenever you think you need it. Um, your practitioner will talk to you about what they think is, is the best pathway for you. And if they think that you would benefit from one-to-one -one coaching, I'm sure they'll give you the best advice. Um, we're not here just to, to flog your stuff. We're here to, to help. Um, so talk to somebody and, and get it, the help that you need. But, you yeah, know, keep on keep on keeping on that's that's the uh, that's the motto <laughs> that's that's the way forward um what should you wear in your ears if you're attending a concert um i would i i would wear ear protection um it depends on what type of concert um but i i would wear ear protection if i'm going to a gig um if i'm going to I'm going to a concert of, of you know, a folk music concert. I probably wouldn't um, because that's bound to be acoustic. So um, I'm not quite sure what happened then. Something happened. Um, but yes, I would I would always wear ear protection. What are your thoughts on bimodal treatments such as uh, Linear? Um, the jury's out. Um, I don't know enough about um, Linear. Yet, well, I know I know a lot about linear, but I don't know about its efficacy yet, and there isn't enough evidence yet. Um, the bimodal approach is something I do definitely believe in. I, I believe that we need to work on two senses at the same time. I think that our brain works so that it it finds that conflicting, and so it's really good distraction. I always talk about bimodal approach in if you, you pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time now you can do that if you're really practiced um which obviously i am because i've been doing this for a while um but it's it's that principle is that you're doing two things at the same time you're getting two different sensations happening and the brain really doesn't doesn't work well with two sensations at the same time it, it's trying to work out what's going on so both those things will distract you from your tinnitus so i think that's a really good idea so the principle um i'm i'm with the device itself there's not enough um evidence yet um for us all to jump on uh jump on with that but i um i'm always interested to find out more and, and find your experience if you've tried it uh i'm gonna do a couple more and then i'm gonna close because um it's nearly nine. So uh, would you offer, Steve says, would you offer and use the same method of tinnitus uh, regardless of what it was caused? For example, I experienced an ear infection. I've been told I have no hi minor high pitch hearing loss. Subsequently, the tinnitus began, or at least that's when I became aware. Um, no, I think that one of the things I've, I've tried to sort of talk about is that I have a, a a toolbox of different therapies and approaches and within the app we certainly have a number of different um, exercises and different different approaches i'm very much that a blended approach is the way forward i certainly found that with my own experience of tinnitus that that the the one way is the way which is what i was trained in um, many, many years ago when I, I trained with um, Jonathan Hazel and, and 
Church and just for many, many years ago, um, was that this is the way and this is what you have to do. And what I found for, my, for myself was that that didn't hit all the points that I needed and it wasn't enough for me. So I've certainly developed um, my therapy uh, and my support that I offer people, but also how we how we've grown also is that it's a, a multi um, therapeutic approach. It's a multi discipline approach using um, support from sleep therapists, um, some somatic physical exercises, breath work, um, ACT, CBT, all sorts of cognitive different cognitive therapy approaches. Um, so no, there isn't a one size fits all. You're not the same as me. Um, I'm not going to be the same as somebody else. And so we all need something slightly different. So I know I wouldn't use the same approach that I'd use um, on somebody else. On saying that, um, you know, I have been known to have to develop something new because I've got somebody new with me. I I worked recently with somebody who's, um, there's, there's something called, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what it's called. We, we developed um, something around gaming theory because this person was really into to gaming and had stopped gaming because of because of their tinnitus, um, video gaming. And um, so we developed a, a, a strategy and introduced gaming and getting them back into what they really loved, which is not something I'd ever thought about doing before, um, but seemed to work really well for them and was where they were at. So it's about being person centered. It's about listening to the person that's sitting in front of you and really working with them in a genuine and authentic way and building that relationship, finding out what's going on with them and uh, hopefully finding something that can help. It can't always help. I mean, you know, it's, I'm not, it's not a magical, it's not magic, um, but it does work in 97% of cases. Um, of all the thousands of people that I worked with, I, there are very few that have walked away and said, no, this is not for me. This is not helping. Um, and you can't help everybody. Um, so you can only do what you can do. Um, I struggle at night. I'm going to do one more. This is the last one. Now, what shall I do as the last one? Shall I do... Um, okay, I'm going to do um, Pinky because this is a, a sound sensitivity one and, and we're talking about sound sensitivity today. So I just want to um, call on that. Um, Pinky says, I suffer from hyper, severe hyperacusis and tinnitus for 15 years. Over the last two years, I've been extremely sensitive to low sub frequencies and changes in pressures, even through walls. It's a bizarre feeling. Even after all these years of having hyperacusis, I've no idea. For example, it could be engines of cars or buses. I can't escape it, and because the low frequencies penetrate the wall, even if I move into another room. Wow. Um, and that sounds really, um, sounds terrible to say, it sounds really interesting. Um, and it it sounds as though there are things that you, you've, you've learned to, to deal with and learned to cope with. Um, but your, your tinnitus, your hyperacusis is changing as your body is changing, as your, your thought patterns and your mindset's changing. Um, I have heard of people feeling sound and feeling low frequency sound particularly and becoming sensitive to, to feeling sound. Um, and I think that's a really interesting um, concept. I would talk to your audiologist. I would talk to your specialist. Um, I would look at um, not trying to escape um, and working on ways of knowing that that's not going to harm you. Because um, I think if you're feeling that you want to escape, then perhaps we need to look at well, what do you think is going to happen when you're hearing it? 
um, and, and build on, on that. So that's kind of where I'd probably go, but I don't know. I mean, it's, um, it will be something that you'd need to, to talk to somebody about, I think. Um, but I would definitely recommend that you talk to somebody um, because I think that would be um, something that would be probably very challenging for you and something that you're obviously out seeking help for. So I would, I would take it very seriously and I think that you would um, work with somebody about your, your feeling of, of needing to escape. Okay, so um, I will answer other ones um, online and, and send you little messages back if that would be helpful. But I'm going to close up the, the session now. Um, thank you so much for, for your, your um, questions. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. I hope it's been helpful for you. If you would like to talk to us, please do. Um, the team are always there at Otto. Um, and um, let's see if we can we can get you through some of this. All right. Be kind to yourself and take care. And um, hopefully I'll see you again. Take care now.